So this session is being recorded, um, just so that you're aware, and will be available on the website where you um, initially booked. So if you want to share the recording with anyone else, please just send them the link. So anybody speaking on the microphone um, and any messages will also be recorded. If you're having connection problems, it's probably best if you enter through Google Chrome or Safari. We found that the connection is much better. And for the purpose of this lecture, for the main part of the lecture, uh, microphones and cameras have been muted. And this is to um, increase the bandwidth so that we get less interference during the actual presentation. Um, if you want to ask questions as you go through, as as Liana speaks, then we can, um, if you put them, post them into the chat and then I'll field those questions at the end. Or if there's time at the end, we'll have opportunities for hands up and perhaps putting microphones on. Um, most of you have already found the, the uh, chat panel. To access the chat panel, you'll see a little chevron at the bottom right hand corner of the screen. If you click on that, and then on the um, little purple balloon, chat balloon, and then you can type your um, message in there. Um, if you want to do download the presentation so that you can see the slides in bigger, bigger um, format, you can do that by clicking at the top of the screen, a little box with a down arrow, and you can download the, um, the actual PowerPoint slides. Um, if you can't hear, check your own um, computer's volume control. Or if that doesn't work, if you go into the cog symbol and check the settings um, within the Collaborate panel. But I think everybody can pretty much hear. If there are any problems in the meantime, I'll try and help you out, although I'm not a techie person, but I will try to help you. Um, and finally, um, before before one one last slide, if you want to leave the session or you need to leave the session or at the end of the, of the um, presentation to actually leave collaborate at the bottom center of your screen, there's a little head and shoulders icon. If you click on that and um, a pop up box comes and it asks if you if you want to leave the session. And just a reminder of our next lecture. Uh, so. Next week, Tuesday, 25th of April, 6.30 UK time, Dr. Fergal Finnegan will be presenting The Politics of Voice, Biographical Research, Critical Social Science and Tackling Social Inequality. And we look forward to work, working with him next week. So um, that's all from me. I'm going to stop sharing these slides and I'll introduce Liana and then I'll um, load Liana's slides at the same time, hopefully. So Dr. Liana Beatty is Associate Head of the Department at Edge Hill University. Liana gained her doctorate at the University of Ch Chester for her autoethnographic research into how academics with Soviet background construct their perceptions of educational leadership um, at a contemporary UK university. Liana's research interests are mainly around the issues of educational leadership, autoethnography. Sorry, I just um, realised I hadn't clicked that. Autoethnography and creative approaches to qualitative inquiry. Um, she has a number of publications that reflect these key themes, including a recent text, Symbiotic Autoethnography. Liana also teaches across many education programs and supports masters and PhD students as a supervisor. And if you want to find her on Twitter, I'll just click on this slide. If you want to find her on Twitter, she tweets at Liana Beatty, um, spelt there as it is on the slide, and at symbiotic auto e one dot. So Liana. Welcome and thank you very much for coming. Um, I'll mute my camera and microphone now. And uh, yes, please go ahead with this wonderful presentation. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Paula. And thank you everyone for attending. I hope you won't feel at the end that your time has been wasted. 
And um, my thanks, special thanks also goes to Lynette Turner for making this presentation happen. Thank you, Lynette. So um, I will start with the title, um, which might look a little bit strange to you, where I put a question, Otto Esno what? Because I hear this question quite often when I talk about my research, especially in the company of people who are not familiar with research. And when they ask me, what is it that you do at HL University and what your research is about? Um, and as soon as I start saying autoethnography, I hear this question, autoethno what? So it's um, one of the questions that I hear quite often. Now, in terms of people who are familiar more or less with autoethnography, I feel there is another confusion that comes from the comments, such as, um, especially from my students. I have a diary from my school teaching practice. Can this be called autoethnography? Or I have notes and photos from my visit to a research conference. Can I turn this into autoethnography? So, my simple answer to the second kind of this question is no. Your notes, your diaries, photos, letters, memories, etc., they're not autoethnographies. And to expand on my um, answer really about what is autoethnography, I have to go back to the first question and the very root of what autoethnography actually is. So the main point I would like to emphasize here is that autoethnography, as the word itself suggests, is a fusion of three interrelated components, auto, ethno, and graphy. This means that our autoethnographic projects must use our personal experience, which is auto, to describe, interpret, and represent in writing, and I highlight this word and I will explain why, uh, which is graphy, our beliefs, practices, and identities associated with a specific cultural phenomena, which is ethno. From this statement, you can see that the blend of this personal and cultural, uh, personal and cultural represents the hallmark of autoethnography as an approach to a qualitative inquiry. So in my view, and in my view only, autoethnography is a written piece of work that explores cultural phenomena through personal subjective experiences of this phenomenon. Now, some researchers might disagree with me because um, it, as you will see, and you probably already seen this happening, you will see that in the field of autoethnography, there are many different types uh, of uh, presentation that people still call autoethnographies. And that will include dance, musical performance, poetic presentations, and many other forms, which I personally would not describe as autoethnography since in my view, um, they lack this essential element of graphy in their projects. So in relation to deciding whether autoethnography is the best approach to your research project, you really need to ask yourself a question on whether you are trying to explore a specific cultural phenomenon rather than thinking about your experiences as a starting point for your project. For me, this is the most important thing, the, to start with exploring a phenomena, a cultural phenomena. And that should be your first step in your thinking. Which cultural phenomena am I interested in exploring? And this, of course, can be anything from exploring culture of teaching phonics or culture of school management or culture of working with your project supervisor to culture of promoting, I don't know, sustainability in your organization. So the variety of subjects are is quite wide, but the concept of culture is used here in a broader sense that embraces any ideas, customs, and social behaviors of a particular person or a group of people or even a society. So once you 
have decided that, uh, on uh, what specific cultural phenomena you're planning to explore, the next question for you to ask would be, have I got any unique, significant experiences of that cultural phenomena that can actually contribute to the current debate in the field about this phenomenon? And your decision to carry out this autoethnographic research will not be easy. So some people think, oh, I'm going to do autoethnography because I think it will be easy because I don't need to collect data. Well, that is a misconception. There are multiple lines of criticism related to autoethnography, which you will have to overcome when you're writing your own autoethnographic uh, study. And the number of researchers, as you can see from the slide, uh, claim that it is not a real research. Uh, I will let you read through the slide and some of the things that are on the slide, I wouldn't even dare pronounce it in a public forum. However, this is a published work from some authors. So you can see the types of challenges you have to overcome when um, dealing with autoethnographic research. So um, when I was carrying out my own doctoral research, I also got um, inspired by one of Lev Tolstoy's greatest novels, War and Peace. And that helped me think more about the variety of uh, autoethnographic approaches that exist out there. So the one challenge that I already mentioned is to overcome a criticism related to autoethnography. And the second challenge for me as a doctoral student was also to pick the right type of autoethnographic research that actually fits uh, my, uh, my own research. And as you're familiar with autoethnography, you would have heard about evocative, analytic, collaborative, critical autoethnography, and I have just added a new type to it, which is called symbiotic autoethnography. The reason I did that is because none of the approaches that I have experienced actually resonated with me in the way that they would have helped me to answer my research question. So how did I come up with this idea? Um, as I mentioned, I started thinking about autoethnography when I was carrying out my own doctoral research, and I got inspired by one of Lev Tolstoy's greatest novels, War and Peace, um, where Tolstoy chronicled the French invasion of Russia and the impact of the Napoleonic era on Tsarist society, not through a precise chronological description of historical events, but through the stories. The stories told by people from five Russian aristocratic families, which you can see on that slide. And it was that exploratory capacity of personal stories that determined my methodological commitment within the research design of my own study. And that was about um, academic perception of educational leadership. However, once I considered using autoethnographic research, uh, the first dilemma for me was to decide which autoethnographic approach was more suitable for my study. And that proved to be impossible, as I discovered that my study resonated with different autoethnographic features from several approaches. And so that's why I decided to come up with my own approach of um, symbiotic autoethnography. And in symbiotic autoethnography, I uh, suggest that it, this approach almost tries to reconcile all the differences and synthesize central aspects from the diversity of existing arguments, suggesting one adaptable, I put framework in inverted commas because framework sounds a little bit too rigid for me, but I'm offering seven characteristic features of autoethnographic research. And again, these features would be not uh, put in a rigid format. I always explain this as if they are droplets of oil on top of the surface when they expand and overlap with each other or disappear altogether. So 
it should be suitable for any type of research. And as a researcher, you will be picking and choosing the type of uh, features that you can emphasize or completely eliminate from research. So this uh, diagram shows you which seven features I'm suggesting to be part of symbiotic autoethnography. And I'll talk a little bit about each of these features. Well, these include um, political dimension, um, researcher omnipresence, interpretative analysis, reflexivity, temporality, evocative storytelling, and polyvocality. So if you write your thesis or you write your work and you want it to call symbiotic autoethnography, I think elements of all these have to be present. Otherwise, it wouldn't be symbiotic autoethnography. So we'll start with talking about time and time-related context, talking about a symbiotic temporality. And I have to apologize. I will um, dwell a little bit longer, perhaps, on this slide, because it is a very complex notion. And it took me some time to get my head around it when I was writing the book. And I came to conclusion that time and time-related context are central to our understanding of any cultural phenomena. And yet, despite growing corpus of autoethnographic research, I found that relatively small number of studies make this concept of time their investigative focus. In fact, um, a few autoethnographic studies seem to neglect altogether the temporal aspects of the experiences, both theoretically and methodologically. And in a way, this strikes me as a surprising gap, considering the significance of time in our life occurrences. So that's why you will see that temporality is included in my approach as an essential feature, and also as a way of theorizing about the dynamic nature of our experiences. Now, if we look at the Oxford Dictionary definition of temporality, it describes it as a state of existing within or having some relationship with time. However, I argue that when it comes to autoethnography, this definition sounds incomplete, as autoethnographic temporality includes more than just reference to time. Therefore, I propose kind of a loose definition of symbiotic temporality as researchers' perceptions of chronological times, which is subjective, as experienced across different localities, which is locational, and captured in the moment of writing, which is evanescent. So just to summarize, symbiotic temporality for me is this combination of three different approaches to chronological time, subjective, locational, and evanescent. Now let's have a little look at each one of them uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, the issue of autoethnographer's subjective perception of time can be seen as inherent and almost inescapable feature of autoethnographic temporality. To say that autoethnographers only refer to precise chronological units of time in their narrative is an absurdity because we don't do that. The evidence from wide assortment of autoethnographic studies is against this positivist claim. And yet, Resigning to complete rejection of chronological time for many autoethnographers would be totally untenable. So autoethnographic temporality to bring this in symbiosis in terms of serving as the middle ground that allows autoethnographers to both anchor their stories within specific chronological times while also acknowledging and negotiating the subjective experiences of these times. Well, I'll give you an example, because it's uh, when we talk about these complex theoretical notions, it's sometimes difficult to get your head around those. But for example, if I go back to the times, well, if you 
probably guess from my accent, I'm not native speaker of uh, the English language. I was born in Soviet Georgia, which was part of the Soviet Union. So on the 25th of December 1991, USSR as a country ceased to exist. And I was there at this moment in time. So in a way, I can anchor my chronological time to that particular date and to that particular year. But when I think about my subjective experiences, I don't think about the date. I think about what it felt like to be in the Soviet Union on that particular day and that particular time. And that's what gives me this symbiosis uh, of uh, chronological time with our subjective experiences. Now, the next one that I mentioned, um, well, in a way, this example shows that our autoethnographic narratives also have this inseparable connection to various sociocultural localities. Well, I deliberately use the word locality here because in most cases, localities are different from geographical spaces or settings. Localities in most cases in my view, are not defined by any visible boundaries. They can even exist sometimes only in our imagination. Um, so sometimes researchers would perceive themselves as tied to static localities that are moving through times. And sometimes they would feel that almost time is moving through them as an integral part of these localities. So therefore, I define autoethnographic temporal locality here as a particular cultural phenomena under study that is demarcated by commonly acknowledged or illusory boundaries as they appear in the moment of writing. For example, if I go back to my um, example um, of the Soviet Union, there was no Soviet Union, so there was no location instead of geographical location, I was almost suspended in my own locality of being between and be betwixt the two worlds. Um, and finally, when uh, I mentioned the third element of um, symbiotic temporality, I mentioned evanescent nature of autoethnographic uh, temporality. Uh, it took me quite a while to come up with this notion because as I was writing, I felt like um, I was writing down about my memories, but my memories were not the memories that I had at a uh, previous time. They were, were memories and uh, about the events in the way I remembered them in the moment of writing. So in terms of this evanescent nature of autoethnographic temporality, I consider it useful to juxtapose it here to our traditional chronological perception of time associated with past, present, and future. Using this structural reference really does not harmonize with autoethnographic writing. If you wrote autoethnography, you probably would have felt it yourself where you can't really differentiate whether you're writing about the past or writing about the past in the present, uh, it all becomes very, very confusing. In this sense, our, I call it past-present, it becomes just another unhelpful dichotomy as we usually cannot separate our past from our present. Well, indeed, think about this now. What is our past? Can we point at it? Can we touch it? What we have is just our memories of the past. But since our past only exists in our present memories of it, I consider symbiotic temporality to be just a snapshot of our temporal recollections of events, places, feelings, relations caught in their almost illusory stillness during one specific moment of writing. So when you write your autoethnography, you capturing this moment in stillness of your writing. What happened before was different and what will you will feel uh, or think later will be different. So it is useful 
I thought, to acknowledge this in your writing, especially if you're writing your thesis, to acknowledge that what you put on paper here is capturing your thoughts at the moment of writing. And that is what I call symbiotic autosnography. This is almost our attempt to hold our memories still by the process of writing. Indeed, we write our autosnographic stories looking back at the events that chronologically took place in the past. But what makes us apprehend the idea of the past is the fact that we have present memories of them. We have present past, I call it. So in practical terms, symbiotic approach suggests that making these discussions explicit in your research, highlighting the limits and possibilities of thinking outside and beyond the logic of chronological times makes it real for the reader makes it understandable um, in terms of your approach to the times. Um, so I hope I explained it in sufficient detail. So I'm going to move on now to the next one, next feature of um, symbiotic autosnography, which I define as omnipresence. Um, this aspect of my autosnographic praxis has been influenced by Leon Anderson's concept of complete member researcher. If you already know things about autosnography, you probably would not have escaped reading about this conflict or contrast between evocative and um, analytics, uh, analytical um, autosnography. So according to Leon Anderson, who suggests this idea of analytic autosnography, researchers membership is defined as being one of the individuals in a group uh, who has another cultural identity and goals of documenting and analyzing action while purposefully engaging in it. So that's according to Anderson, what makes you autoethnographer, analytic autographer. Wait, I argue here that most of our autoethnographic studies cover lengthy periods of life where uh, when we are members of specific cultural group first, without having identity of researcher, and second, not trying to purposefully participate in research. And nevertheless, we're fully embedded in that culture and are part of that culture, and thus a complete member of it, the position that I actually call researcher's omnipresence, or a property of being present everywhere at the same time. For example, again, going back to the times where I lived in Georgia, when I lived in Soviet Georgia, I did not consider myself being a researcher. I never even dreamt that I will come to England and write a book about symbiotic autosnography. So uh, nevertheless, I used this cultural phenomena that I experienced in Soviet Georgia as an autoethnographer. So that's one concept that kind of contradicts um, Anderson's position. Also, when he talks about membership, that kind of goes against the grain of photoethnographic research. Because when we think about membership, it seems to indicate a specific time framework that allows the researcher to enter and to leave a specific cultural setting by almost canceling their membership. However, our autosnographic narratives involve our permanent omnipresence of different layers of cultural experiences at the same time. The fact that I lived in the UK for 25 years and the fact that I worked as a researcher for 16 years does not mean that I have left the membership of my Soviet experiences behind. They are layers of my identity. They are layers of my experiences. So um, that's what I wanted to um, talk about in relation to omnipresence. It's very hard to talk about this in this very limited period of time. So if you're interested in more, of course, you will find more information in the book. So the next feature um, I would like to 
um, talk about is um, I call it polyvocality. I didn't uh, uh, come up with this word myself. You probably heard this word and it's not new. And the concept is not new either. The concept of polyvocality is as a methodological and ethical feature of qualitative research, um, also been mentioned by such researchers as Bakhtin, Tobin, Congergood. They all wrote about the issues related to representing multiple voices in the researcher studies. Um, and so leaning on their arguments, I suggest kind of enhanced interpretation of polyvocality in the context of symbiotic autosnography as a space for capturing simultaneously complex entanglement of autosnographers' narratives with the other. The other I mentioned here with the capital letter. And the other for me includes characters from your stories that you write about, potentially your participants. I had participants in my research, autoethnographic research. And also researchers' multiple selves, or these layers of identity that, that I mentioned about. So throughout our autoethnographic journeys, our these fractured segments of self almost become disturbed and managed and shaped by the encounters with this multifaceted other. Every time we meet somebody new, every time we encounter another new relationship, it changes us and we change them. So these voices that we have that we think is our own voice might not be just our own voice. It might resonate with the voices that we heard coming from other people. So these multiple others form a symbiotic polyvocal narrative where each of the voices has equal significance in representing this mesh of social cultural connections uh, with the purpose not just um, I'm looking um, using Patty Lazar's words now, purpose of not looking harder or more closely, but of seeing what frames are we seeing. So looking a little bit deeper of what we, why we're thinking what we're thinking. And also polyvocality is very useful when it comes to ethical approval, getting ethical approval. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. So polyvocality can be used as one of the tools for um, supporting your ethical considerations within autoethnographic study, which you probably know is, is a very, very challenging aspect of autoethnography. So we're moving on to the next uh, one, which is evocative um, feature of autoethnographic, symbiotic autoethnography. Now, uh, evocative uh, feature is quite easy to explain compared to other features. And my decision to include evocative storytelling uh, has been provoked by a number of authors. And undeniably, autoethnographic studies have to include evocative stories since when the researchers emphasize the personal, it's kind of a new kind of theorizing occurs through juxtaposing emotion, voices, temporality, points of view, enabling us to read, reenact, and reflect with all our senses. And it is appropriate at this point to emphasize that I do not see evocative storytelling and analytic scrutiny as mutually exclusive, because that's one of the main criticisms of autoethnography. They say you're too emotional in your writing and there is not enough analysis. I maintain that the segregation between evocative and analytic creates another unhelpful dichotomy, leading to a false assumption that critical analysis is in some way discordant with emotive text and that emotionally charged narratives are somewhat incompatible with analysis. Um, and that, of course, takes me to the next slide, which is um, interpretative analysis. And uh, as I just mentioned, I do not support the detachment of evocative writing from analytic work. 
and thus I see interpretative analysis as another essential feature of symbiotic autosnography. So I suggest here that interpretative analysis in symbiotic approach aims at merging autosnographic narratives within a sound theoretical basis that is critically interpreted with consideration of researchers' omnipresence across their spatio-temporal experiences. And we already talked about this localities and locational and temporal experiences. So more or less you will know how complex this might become when you start writing about these issues. So as noted by Spry, you can see that in front of you, uh, good autosnography is not simply a confessional tale. It is a provocative weave of story and theory. And uh, similarly supported by Alan Collinson. And I will let you read that. Okay, so the next one, um, as you could see on my previous slides uh, with the diagram, uh, was about political uh, feature of, uh, or transformational feature of symbiotic autosnography. This aspect of interpretative analysis intertwines closely with political transformative focus of symbiotic autosnography. Um, to indicate my intention to almost problematize and politicize autoethnography. Uh, and uh, as um, the laureate and Sambrook say, moving it beyond a world of harmonious social order into a political radical world where dissensus and power conflicts prevail. In this sense, symbiotic autoethnography research contributes to a body of work in which radical forms of academic writing almost destabilize and discard dominant discursive dichotomies and explore new ways of interrogating established hierarchies, established relations of powers within them. Specifically, in symbiotic approach, autosnographers are expected to problematize representation and identity through self-disclosure of the experiences of inequality, social justice, etc. Thus, in symbiotic autosnography, the unity of political and transformative aspects form as this conceptual synergy that enables autosnographers representation of the experiences um, as price as personal, political and palpable. And um, yeah, sometimes my students say, well, there is nothing political in my work. There is nothing political in the way I want to explore phonics. There is nothing political in the way I want to um, change uh, maybe um, curriculum within the uh, early years education, to which I always say everything is political. Indeed, I will stand by the statement that absolutely everything in this world is political. So it is our role and our duty to find this political aspect and um, it, which will enable autosnographers share the experiences of specific cultural phenomena using this uh, focus or a specific lens. And that naturally takes me to the next um, point of our discussion and the next um, issue of uh, feature, sorry, of symbiotic autosnography, which is reflexivity. Naturally, no research can exist without a researchers being reflexive. But symbiotic reflexivity entails a researcher's consistent and conscious engagement in different forms of reflexive activities as applied to the theoretical, methodological, and ethical aspects of their study. These three components form the basis of symbiotic reflexivity that is defined in this context as the researcher's simultaneous consideration and scrutiny of their own epistemological, methodological, ethical assumption in terms of examining both the possible underlying sociocultural source of this assumption 
and also the ways in which they inform the construction of the phenomena in the study. Um, so that um, kind of um, summarizes very quickly all my seven features of uh, symbiotic oceanography. So on the next couple of slides, I will try to explain a little bit more about how it can be practically used and talk more about practical aspects um, of symbiotic oceanography. And the first one is related to data. That is a very challenging data. What is data generally in oceanography and what is data in symbiotic oceanography? Naturally, this is the very first question that arises when talking about working with oceanographic data. What is considered as data? And in, in my view, the answer to this question is paradoxically both simple and complex. Because in my view, in autoethnography, everything is regarded as data. And if we go back to what Alice and Bochner say, in autoethnography, where research is the subject, the researcher's interpretation of the experience becomes the data. And this means that when it comes to autoethnographic research, what counts as data expands greatly, creating for us as researchers difficulty of representing, presenting, and analyzing our own experiences as data. And as the next slide illustrates, this is my own uh, idea of what data is in autoethnography uh, in symbiotic way. And you will see here that I have included the whole complexity of our experiences, including even dreams and uh, um, our diaries and uh, silences. So the complexity uh, of working with autoethnographic data, in a way, is where the boundaries between traditional and what, um, again, Elizabeth St. Pierre describes as out of category forms of data become blurred to the point where the sources of data cannot be positively determined or predetermined. Um, in contrast, the data pool here incorporates our emotions, feelings, our bodily senses captured in the act of writing, where these fragments of data intertwine, collide, and merge with each other in such an intricate and at times unexpected and uncomfortable way. So I, uh, following the agreement that everything in, auto, in symbiotic autoethnography is data, uh, I also wanted to mention um, that if we talk about in traditional research about collecting data, I'm talking about methods of data collection. I think these conventional methods of data collection need to be reconsidered in the context of autoethnography, with a focus, as I suggest, biotic approach of discerning rather than collecting data, where discerning is understood as a process of imaginative and creative techniques of recognizing relevant um, potentially valuable fragments of experience within that complex fabric of researchers' life journey. Um, but we need to pick the ones that actually can contribute to a better understanding of the cultural phenomena and the study. That's why we don't collect data. The data is there. We are the data. So our task as autoethnographers is to discern the data from our experience if this is that is more relevant to the cultural phenomena under study. This process offers limitless possibilities in the choice of data sources, making it possible to discern data which is not obtainable through more traditional ways of data collection. How do you collect data on feelings or bodily experiences? Uh, so Yet, it also brings about the challenges of selecting a specific selection of data from this your multiplicity of field nodes that might include, but 
are not limited to memories, feelings, experiences, dreams, photographs, various memorabilia, records of interviews with participants. Um, so that just, uh, you know, to name just a few. So to make our um, process of discerning data a little bit um, maybe streamlined or more manageable, should I say, it might be useful to distinguish two symbiotically connected layers of what might be considered as first possible sources of data. And you can see this, I highlighted this, this uh, on the gray shaded area in the middle of the diagram. And even the, though the boundaries between these two will always remain blurred and the categories within them fluid and overlapping, um, the more tangible forms of data discerned from the sources are highlighted um, in gray text boxes. And again, it is hard to represent this on a slide. It is hard to put this on paper because despite this attempt to somehow streamline the process of discerning the data, the fragments of data always, what I would say, leak into each other, creating this symbiosis of fluid and intertwining data fragments. But again, acknowledging this in your writing, uh, it, it adds value to your autoethnography. Auto um, this acknowledging this complexity, along with recognizing the ineptness of our language instruments for communicating evocative nuances of the data, is one of the key tasks, really, of autoethnographers in the context of um, the symbiotic approach. And um, Finally, um, I think I've got a little bit of time. Yeah, I think I've got sufficient time to talk to you about ethics. I think this is um, one of the most challenging parts of autosnographic writing because so many people come to me in hysterics, say, how do I pass um, ethical approval, uh, ethical application? Uh, because it's, it's almost impossible. Um, so let's uh, discuss here a symbiotic approach to the issues of ethics. And I suggest also some practical steps um, to help autoethnographers address some of the key issues. So I don't know whether you can see it on your screens. It's quite small on my screen. But on this diagram, I have attempted to represent all aspects of autoethnographic ethics as construed in the context of symbiotic autoethnography. Uh, I will try to explain a bit more detail in more detail about the identified features. So you can see the, the two main um, circles there. We, first one is procedural ethics, and the second is embodied ethics. So we'll talk about this uh, first. Let me change this. Um, yeah, so despite the ambiguity of ethics criteria in the field of autoethnographic research, autoethnographers, like any qualitative researchers or any researchers conducting studies that involve humans, are required to meet the guidelines of research ethics committee or committees associated with particular institutions. Uh, in different countries and different cultures. This will be all different, of course. But overall, the role of these committees is to review researchers' applications for ethics approval and ensure that uh, research processes are duly attended to. So, and that's what we categorize as formal processes, as procedural ethics that involve researchers' engagement with issues such as uh, participants informed consent, the right to withdraw, confidentiality, deception, protecting participants from harm, etc. Well, interestingly, uh, Norman Denzen makes a specific point in relation to ethnographic research, arguing that institutional research ethics committees assume that one model of research fits almost all forms of inquiry, presuming almost a 
static, monolithic view of the human subjects, but we all different, aren't we? And we all very dynamic. So I don't know how one set of um, criteria can apply to all human subjects. And this position gains firm traction in the context of symbiotic approach to ethics, as it is based on a symbiotic interconnection between procedural framing of the ethics and the embodied ethics, as I call it. And when I talk about embodied ethics, I define it as a fusion of situated, situational, relational, and reflexive ethical judgments. It will help greatly, well, it helped my students greatly to write about this in the ethics, um, ethical considerations and their chapters within the thesis because it almost helps help them justify their ethical choices. So let's talk a little bit about these elements. Um, now let me click on the next slide. So um, one of the key tenets of symbiotic approach to ethics is based on the acknowledgement of this uniqueness of every ethical dilemma, calling for individual approach and situated ethical consideration for all those involved. Now, uh, in the context of embodied ethics, situated ethics are understood as autosnographers' ethical decisions associated with and drawn from particular spatio-temporal localities situated in the context of the cultural phenomena under study. Which means, in simple terms, that when you consider your ethical assumption, make, sorry, make uh, ethical assumptions, um, you have to consider the whole um, environment within which these ethical considerations are taken, including the context, the full context of the cultural phenomena under study. Reflecting explicitly on these aspects within the documentation accompanying your procedural ethics would help you to create kind of stronger nexus between the requirements of research ethics committees and the researchers embodied situated ethics. Well, for example, in my ethics application for my autosnographic research project about educational leadership, in Soviet and neoliberal context, I made explicit references to the potential influences of my embodied Soviet experiences on the research processes and my interactions with the participants. At the same time, to strengthen the links to procedural ethics, I also aligned my ethical consideration with the relevant ethical standards, which in my case, were associated with the British Ethical Research Association, BIRA, um, as you know it, uh, with the guidelines emphasizing the point that certain guidelines, and actually I'm quoting BIRA here, may not be appropriate to all circumstances. In particular, different cultural contexts are likely to require situated, my emphasis here, judgments. So that's very briefly about situated ethics and how you acknowledge it in your thesis or in your writing. The next one is um, situational, embodied situational ethics. Um, it sounds very much like situated, but it, it, it cannot be used interchangeably. These two con concepts are quite different. Um, as previously discussed, uh, situated ethics deals with ethical issues related to specific physical sort of uh, spatio-temporal context. In contrast, situational ethics, as the name suggests, deals with ethical issues arising from different research situations where commonly accepted ethical standards are considered less important than the outcome of particular situation. I'll give you an example in a minute, so it will become a little bit more clear. And uh, some of the most popular examples of situational ethics 
are related to, for example, issues such as euthanasia, abortion, conjoined twins, um, deaths, just a few, name just a few. So I suggest that situational ethics as part of the embodied ethical practice is understood as a dynamic symbiotic interaction between the researcher's bodily responses to different ethical situations and the sociocultural circumstances in which the situation takes place. So in this sense, situational ethics cannot be separated from situated ethics, but they're still quite different since any ethical dilemma is embedded in a specific sociocultural uh, context. Well, as I promised, I'll give you an example now of situational ethics. Rihanna, sorry to interrupt. It's half past seven and the lecture's due to finish at uh, quarter to eight. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm almost done. This is last two slides. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to leave okay. time for questions. Thank you. Yes, of Thank course. You. Of course. Yeah. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I promised to give you an example from my own research pra practice on situational ethics. When I was carrying out an online um, interview with one of my participants, her parents overheard our discussion and decided to join the conversation. Uh, it was an online interview. So I was aware at that point that it was against the procedural requirements to um, gain a, a written consent from all participants prior to the interview. However, using my intuitive situational ethics, I continued the interview regardless as I found it inappropriate to ask the participant's parents to leave. Instead, I asked the participant um, kind of on the spot whether she was comfortable with the interview to be carried on. And as a result, I was provided with new and extremely valuable insights into the issues of Soviet leadership. Since parents appear to have more experience of the phenomena than the participant herself. But, um, I mean, at the later stage, I shared my transcripts with both the participants and her parents. However, should I have followed procedural ethics at this time of the interview, that valuable data would have been lost. Um, thus, in situational ethics, autosnographers' reflexivity becomes also paramount as finding this balance between the requirements of procedural ethics and embodied ethics of a particular situation requires genuinely reflexive approach. And finally, uh, I'm going to um, briefly mention embodied uh, reflexive experiences. This is about uh, us becoming almost um, making spontaneous ethical decisions that are centered in relation to our bodily experience bodily experiences and responses to specific situations. Um, at the same time, it's worth acknowledging the need for heightened levels of reflexivity, as I mentioned, in dealing with this situation, as well as the researcher's ability and preparedness to conduct research with always integrity, exercising intellectual honesty, fairness, transparency, uh, and high sensitivity to issues, especially of social justice, power imbalance, and conflict of interest. Uh, and finally, um, so many times I've been asked to talk about this, uh, autosnographic modes of inquiry aimed at moving away from the idea of one objective truth towards subjective narrative through resulted in uh, incongruences between embodied and procedural ethics. These ethical intricacies are embraced by the notion of relational ethics and are generally related to engaging with and representing the other, uh, as I mentioned, the characters from our stories. Indeed, like most qualitative research where participants' identities are anonymized, Autoethnographers typically use their own name in publishing the research, which makes it difficult and sometimes impossible 
to protect the anonymity of others mentioned in the story. Now, here, I want to suggest um, just a couple of strategies and practical steps. Uh, one of the ways of addressing these relational ethic issues is uh, about, for example, informed consent. This issue, of course, is less problematic when researchers work with the data acquired through their relations with the participants, where participants actually can sign the research con consent and read about the um, research aims. And yet, how narrative researchers tell their stories of their participants is not unproblematic, since notion of authenticity implies that the single true representation is achievable. So in a way, one of the ways I already mentioned is to use polyvocality, where you almost disguise other people's voices and intertwine it with your voice. So it's almost impossible to differentiate who says what, where uh, everybody's voices are. And this way, you almost protect yourself and you protect the others or participants of your stories through using this um, multivocal uh, narrative structure. And also, of course, you can use third person pronouns instead of using I, you can use she or he or they. Um, because that's not important. We're exploring the cultural phenomena, remember. We're not exploring necessarily who we are. We're exploring our experiences of this cultural phenomena. And um, changing different elements of the story, um, such as, for example, the timings, the locations, the descriptions, etc. Anything that creates this um, almost uh, opportunity to, I wouldn't use the word hide, but disguise the actual characters from the story. And most importantly, of course, acknowledging that what you're writing about, it is your opinion captured in the moment of writing today as you're writing it. It might be different tomorrow. It might have was might have been different yesterday. So, and it is your subjective experience which might not be the same with other people's experiences and uh, that is one of the ways you can justify your um, ethical considerations in terms of relational ethics well i think that is that concludes my uh, talk uh, sorry i went over time a little bit i hope you found this useful and as you can see on that slide um every research is almost a connoisseur, so you will be choosing whether you will use symbiotic autosnography or whether you just pick and choose some elements of autosnographic approach. And if you want to find out more, please um, join me on Twitter. And here are the details for you. And um, thank you, Paul. I can take questions now if there are any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liana. Um, apologies for the misconfiguration on the slides there. Collaborate seems to do that. Um, we're getting a bit of feedback here, so I'm going to limit my own conversation. So, um, But first of all, I'd like to just say thank you for a truly informative, inspiring, and dare I say it, cognitively challenging presentation. You've given me lots to think about before. There are some questions in the chat, but um, I think I'd... I'd be able to I think I would rather try to invite the people to put their microphones on and perhaps uh, engage with you in conversation we have just about five or six minutes before we officially finish so mm -hmm. um, so people who've written in the chat uh, Tony Kat Sue and Serik Boysin and Buki, if one of you would like to just put your hand up by just clicking on the icon below and then go ahead and put your microphone on. Tony, yes, please go ahead and ask your question. So bottom of the screen, there's a little microphone icon. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes. Oh, you. Oh, technology. 
after a hard day <laughs> wrestling with teams this is amazing i think that's uh, I've, I've really enjoyed this evening it's been a really interesting and challenging and um uh refreshing debate the work we do is around empowering patients to create their own autoethnographic stories um and so i had several concern the first in, in a multimedia form so um, my first concern was really about the limitation of autoethnographic representation to a, a textual form um but then i noticed that the one of the, the slide before the discerning slide included um for example images uh photographs of video records as as the tangible forms of data in gray boxes so i, I was interested by the the contradiction there um but i was also fascinated by the I, I thought the uh, the the discussion around ethics was really important i think that's really fascinating because we work in a sort of facility model where we help people create their own autoethnographic stories but our fingerprints as facilitators will inevitably be on those stories the facilitator the, the the fingerprints of the process will be on there so where does the ethical uh where do the ethical boundaries lie and how do we avoid uh, i think how do we control as 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 um Ilana was describing this sort of this um necess necessity of having adaptable ethical boundaries for each context really thank you okay thank you Tony. thank you well first of all um i would like to say that when i was talking about symbiotic autoethnography and uh, in relation to data I really mean autoethnographic research in a traditional sense. So we're talking about when you said that your patients are trying to write autoethnographies, for me, they're trying to write diaries or diary entries. They're not writing autoethnographies because to write autoethnography, you uh, discern data when part of the diaries will be the data but then you have to provide analysis of this data and put it into theoretical context. Uh, and also, it has to go through the ethical approval of specific committee. So just writing something in the comfort of your own armchair does not produce autoethnography. It's a process that is associated with specific research study, and it has to go through specific uh, channels that will acknowledge it to be a research study uh, with associated also ethical request and ethical approval. So there is a differentiation there between just writing something and also creating an autoethnographic research. In terms well, of your I, would, I, would, I would say that you've just described an incredibly elitist view of what research is and what the value of personal experience is particularly within the, um, so does only the uh, personal auto-analyzed experience of academics count, or do we actually throw this out and value the contributions of the vast mass of people within, say, we work much within the health service. This is the reason why they, this is exactly the problem with the analysis of patient experience by academics or healthcare professionals, which produces the responses that they want rather than allowing patients to reflect on their own experience to work through say the, the 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 four parts of john's process of reflection and come up with a performative uh, piece of work which they have worked on themselves they have analyzed it's not a recording of them it's something they have created and they have written and i think that is a, a, certainly within services like healthcare that is a, a real problem because all that we have is the system asks the system asks the asks the questions which it wants to know the answer to and so it doesn't get the stories that people want to tell so i think i would argue that there is a a very strong uh certainly within healthcare as an example uh conflict there between the auto and the ethnographic mm -hmm. Now, I, I understand your point, but however, I don't think your patients actually want to carry out research. But what you mentioned is really valuable information, and you might want to carry out research based 
on the stories of your participants. They will become your participants. That will not prevent them from writing about the experiences and reflecting on the experiences. But the researcher will then take these experiences and put them in the context of theoretical framework and also share with wider public because as you probably will agree that if we put the experiences, the written experiences in the drawer, it wouldn't do anybody any good and it wouldn't even be called research. So there is a way of um, utilizing this very valuable experiences and your patients' uh, reflections. I agree with you. Um, I would argue that's a very reductive approach to the experiences of the patients and the patients we have worked with want their own voices to be heard in their own words rather than as one early uh, storyteller said, I don't want this to be disemboweled and modified by researchers who will get a PhD based on my text and I will not be acknowledged. So yeah, I, and I, and I think the, the, the distribution thing, the uh, visibility of patient stories, for example, is something that is um, very much better done by patients putting their stories out via YouTube or via other sites, via patient voice, by, oh, rather than waiting for 10 years until an academic analysis of a group of patient stories is done, surely. Thank, thank you. But these patient stories will not be autosnographies in my view. They will be their stories, which is also very fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Um, uh, we've got just one or two minutes, I think, if you don't mind going over. Um, uh, Kat and Buki, you had questions in the chat or comments in the chat. Do you want to just very, very quickly ask a question or make a contribution? Kat. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, um, I wanted to say thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I've started reading your book. I haven't finished wow. yet because it's a very big, it's a very big book, and I really like reading in detail. I'm fascinated. Auto ethnography is a, a fascinating methodology for me, and I really like reading, you know, um, um, products from all different authors, and. I find them all very interesting, but I also believe, I think something that you had said at the beginning, that this is a methodology which is like up for grabs using a common language. Um, and in a way, um, every researcher can recreate it again and again in his or her very own way drawing or on tradition in you know one way or another and adding on own um subjective um views or theories um or you know frameworks or whatever so yeah this this is how i see it, that you know the book that i'm reading your presentation is very interesting for me but if I was to carry out autoethnography, auto I would again do it in my own way, you know. Absolutely. Of course, of course, utilizing, you know, the aspects of your book or the aspects of other books. Do you agree with that? Yes, yes, I absolutely agree with that, Kat. And actually, this book is the product of what you are doing. Because for me, I explored all these varieties of different approaches and I thought, well, that will fit into my new, um, again, framework is not the word, but I can't find the right word. So absolutely, every autosnography will be different using different features and different elements, but some perhaps would be interested in using all seven features, which will be then called symbiotic autosnography. And you might pick just a couple of features and add your own features. I think this is the value of photoethnography that it is fluid, it's very flexible, and it keeps developing with every new piece of work. It gives us something new. Thank you. You're on mute, Paula. 
<laughs> three I years. I know, three years and we're still doing it. So thank you so much. Um, we will draw this to a close. Um, a really, really one of the, I, I will just read out an important intention being explored by Liana and Tony. And I think it's these these um, lectures are a provocation and they are designed to go away and enable us and encourage us and stimulate us to think about the tensions or our our own beliefs and values. So thank you very, very much for this evening's lecture. I've enjoyed it immensely. And um, judging by the, the comments in the chat, if you have a chance before we, we close the room, go back and have a look. It's been very, very well received. So thank you so much again. Um, just a note to our students, the book is in the library as an ebook if you want to borrow it and use it. So um, thank you, Liana, and um, hopefully we can work together again soon. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you for the, being such a lovely audience and for all your comments. I thoroughly enjoyed sharing thank my story you. with you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm going to stop recording.